you know, as John mentioned, uh, this is extremely labor intensive and expensive. And uh, you know, we all know that, that one of the problems with films today is they're not expensive enough. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, expect exactly. to see lots more of this. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the first thing I add here is, uh, well, I'm not a lawyer, and to quote a line from The Simpsons, nor do I play one on TV, but, you know, uh, uh, it seems like ownership of performance is a really big question here, and, and uh, I think it's something that probably won't be answered by us, be answered by some committee in SAG to see what you do it. But I just want to get anybody's, you know, in, you know thoughts on that, like, you know, if you, because when if somebody owns this, then I know from the film I just finished, you know, we recreated uh, holograms of Sinatra, Elvis, and uh, Marilyn Monroe, and we had to get approval and payment to the estates of all of those uh, those those actors. So, I just like to get anybody's thought on that, like ownership. You know, if there is any. I mean, we're not lawyers; we're creative people. But any comments? No. Uh, well, you know, some of this is, uh, is a bit of a new area. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, a lot of the the uh, examples you mentioned, uh, um, there was no f uh, foreseeing this technology mm -hmm. back in the day. So, you know, there's nothing uh, um, on record from uh, from any of those performers about uh, their wishes about uh, the use of their likeness, and uh, you know, that's a uh, that, that is, I think, a, a serious issue. I think we've done the, the right thing of uh, talking to their estates and the, their heirs about it, but uh, in the end, we still don't know uh, how they, w whether they would have agreed to it. Uh, well, it's, it seems like they need to do something uh, that's similar to like re residuals for for actors when they when they, when their their face is seen someplace. They get you know their face is seen. It's their property. Yeah. You know, I would think so. You know, but. Uh, uh, the next question I had here well, is uh, just okay, one, yeah. one other comment, it, especially with there's appearance and then there's performance. Right. And even the stuff that I just showed you, the, that sort of scary stuff up there, yeah. when you watch the people I'm controlling, it's my performance. Mm -hmm. And I can change the appearance, or we're getting the ability to change the appearance, but the performance is extraordinarily hard to change. That, that's something that we don't have technology to take away. So if I control your face, you can tell it's me controlling your face, or if CeCe's controlling me, you will see CeCe coming through that. Yeah, it's like Karen Conable and, and uh, Maurice Thier. Exactly, exactly. So but on the flip side of that, though, when I am, like right now as I'm here, or as I am, doing an interview like that, that's that's Karen, like da-da-da-da-da-da, or whatever. But when I go into Maurice, my energy trans transforms completely. That's part of the thing. So that's something that you wouldn't recognize as Karen Conival. Me as Maurice, my, ooh, whatever, whatever, whatever I do with my voice, whatever. So I don't know what, what that does, because that's a, that is a, a total energy change for me as an actor. It's the thing that I'm... Um, that's what I do, is <laughs> transform. Um, whether I've got makeup or digital or what, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter what it is. So I don't know how one, how one tracks that, but anyway. But you know, I you just want to then. piggyback on that because one of the things that Jim Cameron said was it seemed as if every seven or eight weeks he goes, this what we did here, it's obsolete. There's something new that's come down the pike. It's completely different. It's going to make it faster, more. And we were constantly changing and moving things around to accommodate new technology. And that's within a two, three-month span. So at the speed that it's going, how are these performers going to catch up? By the time they figure out the first thing, the 15th thing has already happened. Well, it, it, you're speaking from somebody who has to figure out all this stuff and be fast on the day. I think that, the, uh, I, you know, John can certainly, and, 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 and every, all the other visual effects supervisors here, is like, we stay up late to try to just, you show up and do the magic that you do because it comes from somewhere deep inside you, right? And that's what makes the truth the performance, which sort of leads me into this next question. And doing the show, um, I've, I've heard a lot from directors and actors about finding the truth. You know, like, like it's like if, if, uh, if truth is essential to make a, a performance, performance believable and, 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 and point it to people, 
you know, uh, how how does that how does that in how, because truth is the animation the animators have to come in and and help that right, but not not blow it. You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's like a core of a performance that you come over and then you change. And I know on on our movie we did it because Denise said, well, I like it up to here, but I want it to go to here, right? So we had to change. And I'd love to get your your comments on that. Yeah, I mean, for animators are kind of in a weird spot, right? So we're between the actor and the director. And sometimes we'll completely manipulate a performance to where it's not even the same thing the actor did. But it's the essence of what the director was going for. So um, you're, you're still trying to get the same type of performance, but maybe they're turning left instead of turning right. Other times we'll take a couple different performances by that actor and marry them into one, which isn't the preferable way to do it, honestly. It doesn't, it, it always feels a little weird depending on how you cut it together, but essentially it's like an editor cutting together a performance. So it, it's not unheard of in filmmaking, it's just done in a very different way where the animator has control. And uh, so uh, sometimes the animators are bringing their own performance to it. They'll go shoot their own reference and they'll bring that to it. But it's all in service of the character and in service of the director. So, um, you know, depending on what the character is, sometimes they're fully keyframed because they're an animal, say a tiger on a boat, um, or it's tweaking eye twitches to be at the right beat, you know. So it's, it, it we kind of take on responsibilities on both sides, but where that ownership of the performance lies is often often kind of a, a mix of the group. Now, sometimes the more human they are, the more direct it is from the actor to final thing. But depending on how creature they get, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they have many more arms or legs, or, and, and the then, animator is very involved in the performance. And there's a lot of different ways to make a movie. There's a lot of different processes. And, you know, there's you can swing all the way to, you know, like Disney-style animation yep. where you have a team of animators and the actor's on a voice-only contract and they're sitting in a booth and they're recording their lines. Mm -hmm. And then those animators become essentially second, a second team of actors that figure out what the, what the performance is going to be in the movie. Uh, on, on the other side of things is, this is a process similar to what we did on, you know, The Planet of the Apes where... You know, we would be working on set, and the director would work with the actors, and you know, like Matt would lean over to me and say, like, okay, that was pretty good, but I think maybe we want to you know, change the blink or something. And part of our contract was that he, we would go again, and he would try to get that performance there on set with the actors, and that became a, a much tighter template that we would then match to. But we would still do what Matt's talking about, which is the editors would go in and they'd take a little bit from take two and a little bit from take five and they come back to take two and they would refine the performance by blending the best bits of all, everything that the actor did there on the day. Do you find, um, uh, this is for Cece and Karen, do you find that you do more takes or less takes from a conventional film, you know, when you're in the zone, when you're doing, is it about the same? You know, when you're doing performance capture, do you find that is like you spend the same amount of time on getting your scenes or is it is it shorter or longer and because i've heard from somebody somebody told me said yeah like everything's a close up there's no wide shot so the actors are you know any any take could be used as a close up like if you like your previous take i'd love to hear from you guys on that well i <clears throat> i can really own the answer to this from the standpoint of what is it like to work with matt reeves because i mean because no i mean this sincerely in no way is it any different. I, I didn't find it any different um, filming uh, the performance capture role of Maurice than I do from any other role I've done. However, if you're working with Matt Reeves, who is going incisively deeper and deeper and deeper in on every single take, it's very likely that you could wind up doing 20 takes of something as Matt go carves closer and closer to the truth of the scene. So I would say that the number of takes is totally dependent on the refining of storytelling from the director. I didn't notice any, I mean, there's obviously the things that one, if there's, say, another human actor, um, like Amaya in the scene, so there might have to be another pass that one has to take, the human pass and everything. Um, but that aside, I didn't find that the technology affected the number of takes at all. It's just the storytelling, because it's, it's no different from my perspective. As an actor, my involvement is just with the storytelling that way. We did make you wear that horrible oh, sofa. The, that's the uh, suit. I mean, the sofa. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> because Maurice was a, a character that was about, I don't know, three times the size of Karen. 
And we had a little girl that was riding Maurice. So I couldn't, anything that I touched, I, whenever I touched anything, and I, Amaya rode on my back a lot and was constantly connected to me. So um, they built what um, I called the sofa from the moment I saw it. It was like this thick, and it was um, weighed about, I don't know what it weighed, but I remember, all I remember is when it was brought down before we started filming, I shouted, Dan Lemon! <laughs> <laughs> What is this? It's like the day before we start filming war. Anyway, yeah, so that, that a few, was... A few technical challenges. Yeah, but that doesn't really increase the that maybe the time preparing for the shot, but not the actual number of takes. Yeah. I have to ask, CC, did, did, did he really have a tail that you... you Like a tail that you flopped in that scene where you go his tail like... Yes, you know, you're, you're not wearing much yeah. costumes. Yeah, yeah. There's just distinguishing who from whom. So I had ears, mm -hmm. and I had a tail, and I had this beautiful sort of, not that elaborate necklace that you saw me wearing, but something that definitely said, that's Moad. Mm -hmm. And um, just in terms of, it's individual because of who the director is. So my director is Jim Cameron. He is a master technician. He does not act, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> So everything he sees, he, he tweaks. We do a lot of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And then when that camera is ready to roll, he's picking up several things at once. There are many cameras. Yesterday, um, Cece told me something about like this. I'd love if she could just say it again, because it was like you said, it, this, this technology sort of takes you back to when you were a kid. And it did. Yeah, it, it, say, say that. Well, I was going to mention it for a bit. We were so pressured for time. But it's kind of like the kid who gets the fabulous gift in a beautiful box. The gift gets chucked aside, and the box becomes your ship, <laughs> your airplane, your first house, you know, your funeral coffin, and all of these things that your mind just roams free for. In this VOM, which I know is changing because I came from mocap, um, motion capture, you're just in a large gray box and you're told, you know, horses are chasing you, rocks are flying from the air, you know, roll down that hill, duck under, scream, there's fire right behind you, and you're seeing nothing. Sometimes they're throwing sponges at you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. like a paper, whatever they can, because the scene is already set, and you're just the live instrument that goes into it to make the entire scene come alive again. I think it's just beautiful because it takes us back to being kids, you know what I mean? Back to square yeah. one. All right, we have some actual questions from, uh, from the uh, audience, and I have one question of my own that I want to ask, too. So um, the first one is, what as actors can we do to prepare for the technology in casting for the future projects and new skills or anything like that? I think that's a great question. Just briefly, I think do not think of technology because this is the one thing that they cannot quite grasp yet, is you come in with your talent, your bag of emotions, and what it is you want to portray about a character, and just show them what you have to offer. Mm. What do you think? Uh, absolutely. Um, it does, uh, as somebody said earlier, I think it's been said a couple of times too, like maybe and Andy said it too, what it opens up in terms of like the end of typecasting in a way in that way. Though there's other ways that one doesn't need to think in, that, in terms of typecasting, but it, if you can embrace it or bring in your performance um, and explore as far as you can, whether it's an orangutan or a nine foot tall whoever, if you can go there um, in your thinking, in your imagination and in your own <clears throat> exploration of that, then th there's possibilities of these ways to capture it. So I don't think it's about the technology at all. I think it's actually about just even going further deeper in as an actor and setting yourself free to that. I'll also say that, that uh, where all this stuff is going is trying to strip away a lot of the, uh, the technology. Um, you know, despite um, uh, the, a lot of the tech that you're seeing in the, the current state of the art, you know, where it's rapidly going is trying to strip all that away to make this as natural and friendly for the performers as possible. And we do really feel strongly that uh, everything that we're 
doing. We're trying to create the best conditions for performance that we can. You know, we strongly believe that you know, if two characters are in a scene, they got to be playing their performances against each other, um, and not you know, this person's captured three months later. Uh, but you know that when they say, "I need a younger version of CCH Pounder," it's going to be so much easier now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as well, the the. The problems and the preparation, that's kind of our job to figure out. Like, I don't think from the actor, it's not their problem. That's, that's the visual effects problem. Like, how do we remove all the limitations and make it as easy as possible? OK, the next question is, um, can you elaborate more on the animator artistry that goes into helping and bring these performances to life? And it, it bears, brings to mind something. I was always taught when I start, I think when I was working on T2 at ILM, and somebody just came up to me and said, animation is acting. And, and every, all of everybody had to do a scene that really had to animate, you know, the T1000 there at a mirror, and everybody looked into the mirror, and Matt was saying they still do it. You know? We still do that, <laughs> yeah. of course, yeah. Um, I mean, we're all actors that don't get behind the camera. We're, we're behind the camera in the form of, you know, giant creatures and things like that. But we, all those same principles, we study and things that we look at. We look at other performances, and when we're we're breaking down a character, that's the first thing we do. No matter what it is, what if it's an animal, we have tons of reference. If uh, we're out there also shooting reference of each other, we have an animator's acting room in the building for us to go into and do whatever, roll around, and you know a, a lot of the stuff we have to do is pretty physical. So you know we've got certain animators that we've actually typecasted for different things. So. Um, it, it is very much performance driven and how much of that we do, like I said before, varies from project to project. So sometimes it's 100% keyframe and we take it over and it's, it's the animator's performance um, and it's maybe just an actor's voice. Uh, other times, like I said, it's very, we want to stay as true to whatever, you know, needed to be done for that. So, you know, if it's something like Maurice here, you know, you want to stay pretty darn close to what that performance is. So it's less invention and more about you know, getting that performance across that you want. Um, but yeah, it, it's, we'll do everything in the book. But the one thing that has changed a little bit over the years is animators are kind of trained and, you know, I, from kind of a Disney style, um, but that doesn't work in this case. So you kind of have to throw the rule book out a little bit and really study the way things move. And then this is where motion capture is fantastic for animators because there's a lot of weird stuff. If you animated that, you'd get it rejected. But you know, <laughs> when it's motion capture and they do a weird foot thing, it, it's, it just brings that extra layer of life to it. So I, I, find, I think it's a fantastic tool for bringing performance. OK, uh, another question is, do you need formal training if, to do motion performance capture? And if so, where do you study motion capture? Websites, whatever, right? I mean. I think Woody Schultz might be in the audience at this point. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things is, it seems that each company, mm -hmm. because the genre of their film is so special and secretive, my experience, mm -hmm. is that they teach you everything mm -hmm. on site, and that's probably why it takes so long. Mm -hmm. But once you've learned something, then you're actually quite equipped mm -hmm. for whatever the next film is coming. And from the, from the visual effects side, I would say work with as many uh, talented uh, companies as you can work with. I was fortunate enough to work at John's company for a while at Industrial Light and Magic, and I, I learned a great deal, right? And because and, and you, if you try to work with talented people, you'll learn how they're addressing the current technology and all, you know, all the big talented companies, MPC, DNAG, uh, ILM, WETA, are all just pushing the boundaries as hard as they can, right? Every day, digital domain as well. And in terms of uh, preparing to, to do this kind of work, uh, I mean, the advice I'd give to, to actors is, uh, is do your best to just ignore it. Um, you know, you don't do anything different. Uh, act as you would uh, if, the, if none of this technology was present, because that's what we're really interested in. And if you do try to learn the technology and you learn something about it, it's going to be different yep. next year anyway. <laughs> and then one other thing to add to this, like the technology also, most of the technology is really geared around how to help the actors in their performances. And one of the things we've been able to do and see a lot more of is getting the actors in for initial sessions and then being able to turn around a version of them as their creature or their character. So as they're actually doing the performance on set, as they're doing those live performances, they can actually see what their character's going to look like, how much of their performance comes through. So it's no longer quite as blind as it had been in the past. Yeah, a good example for me recently on that was on uh, Rogue One. We had Alan Tudyk playing uh, a droid character. and. Uh, 
Um, we invited him up uh, to, to ILM and uh, he spent an afternoon in our motion capture volume um, with a thing we call the magic mirror where he could see uh, his, his performance in real time mapped onto the droid character so that he had a, a chance to um, play around to see what sort of motions looked good on the droid. You know, how loose does he want to be? Does he want to act more stiff and robotic or does he want to kind of have sort of a slouchy attitude? And he, he got to spend an afternoon trying stuff and, and seeing what felt right for the character and he, he was able to internalize that and then bring that uh, to the set. So he sort of went into that uh, you know, with some confidence that what he was doing was going to look good on the character. I, I remembered my thing about about the, the truth. It seems as if finding the truth in the performances is preserving a, what's true for actors and the director. And then the animators, when they need to, directed by the by the director, they come in and they they try to apply the same truth so it's it holds true and doesn't break character. Right? Like whatever we do. We definitely don't want it to be any different than the character you guys are, are playing because that would just blow it horribly. <laughs> I think the truth is is that we probably have to wrap this up. <laughs> yeah. uh, truth is right. Uh, one last, one yeah. last question is, uh, do you think performance capture will ever be nominated in the acting, acting uh, category? Gosh, I hope so. So do I, yeah. Well, right. so many people do not know what it is and didn't recognize it the first 20 times it came around. <laughs> so. Well, um, this concludes our show tonight. And remember, the future can be scary but also exciting. One thing for sure is that will always happen in the, uh, change will always happen in the world of entertainment, but telling a good story will never go out of style. Please check out the performance capture suit in the lobby on your way out. And if you have time to fill out a survey to suggest what other topics you'd like to see in these presentations, please do so. I'd just like to thank all you guys for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Awesome. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Good night.